Hi guys, Harry here. Welcome to Scrap Science. Before this video starts, I did just want to warn you that this is probably the most boring and useless video I've ever made on this channel. So, you know, I'm warning you, um, click away now or prepare for suffering. Um, back to me. After my last few videos, uh, what I really feel like doing today is a simple experiment, you know, an easy uh, little video, and I think I've found uh, the perfect thing to do, or to demonstrate today, and that is the electrolysis of urea uh, to generate hydrogen and nitrogen gases. The experiment itself is well, pretty self-explanatory. I think um, all we need to do is set up a solution of urea and then electrolyze it and we will be able to collect uh, the hydrogen and nitrogen gases off our two electrodes. So uh, what we're going to do straight away is get right into it, uh, make up our urea solution and start electrolyzing. To get our urea ready for electrolysis, um, I have 4 grams of urea right here and 200 milliliters of distilled water. Um, all we need to do is just dissolve that up in distilled water there. Um, that might take a little while to dissolve. Anyway, while that's dissolving, um, as it is, as a solution of urea in water, um, it's not going to be conductive uh, because urea is not an ionic compound. So as a result, there won't be any charged species in solution and we won't be able to perform our electrolysis directly uh, on this solution here. So to make the solution conductive, uh, all we need to do is add an ionic compound, uh, preferably one that is electrochemically inert to some degree, and also preferably something uh, that has a lot of hydroxide ions in it uh, for reasons that I'll go over later. Um, the best option in this case is potassium hydroxide, uh, to add to our solution, simply because it's extremely conductive. Um, I'm going to be using the next best thing, and that is around 32 grams of sodium hydroxide, um, because potassium hydroxide is a bit more difficult for me to get hold of. So I'll just add a whole bunch of this, maybe not all at once, but eventually we'll get all that dissolved. And there we are, our solution is now ready for electrolysis. Now to do our electrolysis, you can see what I have here is a U-tube, uh, which is extremely handy uh, when we're doing simple electrolysis reactions and we want to collect uh, the gases that are coming off the electrodes. So say we have our electrodes, um, here is just a piece of nickel that we'll be using later. Um, they fit nicely uh, just down the sides of this tube. We can fill it up with our solution um, and the gases that are generated on the electrodes um, are separated and we can take off our gases uh, through these little gas takeoff tubes that I've put on the end. It is going to be really handy today, uh, so I'm just going to pour uh, some of our urea solution straight into the YouTube here. Now, as you can see, uh, I have everything else set up. Um, I've put two electrodes um, into our YouTube. Uh, both of which are nickel. Um, I'll go over why I've chosen nickel as an electrode here uh, in just a little bit. And I have begun uh, supplying 1.5 volts across our two electrodes. So uh, this one on the left is negative. That'll be generating hydrogen gas. And this one on the right is positive. Uh, that will eventually be generating nitrogen and carbon dioxide. Uh, we expect the carbon dioxide uh, to react with the sodium hydroxide that's in solution here to form sodium carbonate. Uh, so the only gas that should come off the electrode uh, will be nitrogen gas. Anyway, as you can see, um, at this 1.5 volts, we are generating um, hydrogen off the cathode. Um, you can see that bubbling off the electrode rather quickly there. Uh, we have about 6 milliamps flowing through the cell right now. Uh, so that's not much gas production, but you can definitely see it there. Um, on the anode, you can also see if you look very closely and you have uh, set the video to a high resolution, which uh, you can do now uh, with this video. If you hadn't noticed, um, you should be able to see tiny little bubbles of what we hope is nitrogen gas. Now you might be thinking, well, Harry, why don't you just increase the voltage uh, in order to increase uh, the rate of production of both of these gases? And that's a good idea. Um, increasing the voltage will increase uh, the current draw of our cell and then 
our reaction rates on both of our electrodes will increase. However, there's a problem with increasing the voltage past 1.5 volts, and that is the fact that voltages much higher than 1.5 volts will start electrolyzing water itself uh, to quite a significant degree. You see, while electrochemical splitting of urea is actually incredibly easy um, in terms of uh, energy requirements, um, thermodynamically, uh, the minimum voltage required to split urea is around 370 millivolts. Uh, so 1.5 volts is definitely in excess there, and the excess voltage uh, is just going towards increasing that current all the way up to, I think now we're approaching 7 milliamps. The electrochemical splitting of water um, occurs at around 1.23 volts. Again, this is the minimum voltage determined by the thermodynamics. So the basic gist of it overall is that on nickel electrodes, um, urea can be split um, electrolytically by voltages between 1 and 1.5, uh, whereas above 1.5 volts, uh, we start to get electrolysis of water occurring, and instead of generating exclusively nitrogen gas, uh, we start to generate oxygen alongside that. And that's something I don't want to do because I actually want to collect the nitrogen uh, and demonstrate that it is nitrogen gas that we're making here. If we run our electrolysis at 1.5 volts, um, which is what we're doing here, um, according to a paper that I read recently about this process, I'll link it in the description, um, the anode gas uh, containing mostly nitrogen uh, will only be contaminated with about 2% oxygen gas, uh, which I think is perfectly all right. Anyway, while this is slowly building up in terms of the current that we're drawing, um, I will connect up some tubing to either one of these gas takeoff tubes and we will get ourselves ready to eventually collect the gases. Right, it's been some time uh, since the last scene, but I completely gave up on the setup we had before. With the tubing uh, that we had connected to our gas outlets, um, I just wasn't able to collect uh, the gases coming off the electrodes, probably because I had quite a few leaks in the system and the slow gas production rate uh, just meant that we just couldn't collect anything. So I've redesigned uh, our electrolysis apparatus once again. Uh, you can see what we've set up is kind of similar to what's known as a Hoffman voltameter, uh, which is a common high school electrolysis demonstration piece of glassware uh, where we have our two electrodes and then the gas is collected um, in glass tubes um, positioned directly above our two electrodes there. You can see what I've done. I painstakingly um, added our sodium hydroxide and urea solution to this vessel and I was able to get rid of all of the air in here. So these two test tubes that I've stuck to the top of our U-tube, um, these are completely filled with solution. There's no gas in them. In fact, there's no gas in this whole apparatus whatsoever. Um, we're connected to uh, just a little reservoir of our solution uh, so that the air from the atmosphere can't get in. But as we fill up these test tubes uh, with gases, the solution will have somewhere to go. So I think this is a much better setup uh, because, well, we can tell there are no leaks. Um, none of the solution is escaping our apparatus. And say we make this electrode the negative one, this electrode the positive one, uh, we'll generate hydrogen on the negative electrode, nitrogen on the positive electrode, and the gases will have nowhere to go except for into our test tubes uh, where we can collect and store the gases for later use. Anyway, let's get right back into it and we'll connect up 1.5 volts to the cell again, negative on the left and positive on the right. Now once again we're not going to see much happening because this is an incredibly slow process. Um, I'm probably going to have to set this up overnight and wait for the gases to collect in their respective tubes. But luckily for you, the viewer, uh, we can just skip forward to when we've actually collected some gases. So I'll see you then. At the start of this video, did I say that this was going to be a simple experiment and like an easy process? Because that was a really stupid thing to say. If we have a look here, I've been running this electrolysis for 24 hours now. And look at all of this nitrogen that we have produced. I reckon that's less than a milliliter. Is that focused? Amazing. So yes, after 24 hours of electrolysis, uh, we have made 
this much hydrogen, I'd call that maybe 5 to 10 milliliters, and then this much nitrogen, which you can barely see. The gases aren't quite in their 3 to 1 ratio. We expected uh, to see 3 uh, units or whatever of hydrogen and 1 unit of nitrogen uh, after we completed our electrolysis. Uh, but due to the fact that there are some side reactions occurring on the anode, um, I think you can see just a little bit that uh, the anode is slightly darker than the cathode, and that's due to the fact that the nickel surface oxidizes slightly um, to generate some oxidized nickel um, catalysts on the surface, which are still conductive and can still allow for electrolysis, uh, but they do subtract from our nitrogen yield. Anyway, I was going to run this experiment until we had a test tube full of nitrogen gas and then, you know, demonstrate that it's nitrogen and not oxygen by um, attempting to do the glowing splint test and show that it uh, doesn't relight a glowing splint. But from the fact that it's going to take around a month to fill up this test tube uh, with nitrogen gas, you know, am I going to wait a month to fill up a test tube with fancy air? No, I'm not. I'm going to give up on this process right now. And it's easy to say, just build a better cell, uh, you know, move the electrodes closer together, uh, give the electrodes more surface area, um, allow for a wider tube between the two electrodes so that all of the current doesn't have to pass through this thin bit of tubing down the bottom here. And then, I don't know, make the cell bigger in general. But if the process of generating nitrogen, even just on this demonstration scale, requires me to build like a custom cell for this electrolysis procedure, like, I'm not going to put that much effort in. I mean, nitrogen isn't really that special. I just really wanted this to be a simple demonstration. So we are just going to completely give up here. And while this quantity of nitrogen is too small to test, you are going to have to take my word for it that this is nitrogen gas. Uh, or if you can't do that, you will have to take the word of the paper I have linked in the description. So look, overall, while it is perfectly possible to scale up this process and feasibly generate a reasonable yield of hydrogen and nitrogen in this highly efficient manner, I'm just not going to do it. It's not worth my time. Uh, if you would like to see something like that, I believe another channel, Robert Murray Smith, who I will link in the description as well, uh, has a couple of videos about this very process generating hydrogen and nitrogen. So you should probably check those out if you want to actually do this yourself more successfully. Other than that, did we achieve what we set out to do? I mean, yeah, we made a tiny little bit of nitrogen gas. Um, was it worth it? Not in the slightest. Um, is this video even worth uploading to my channel? I suppose my channel could do with a bad video or two. I won't mind. I promise my videos are normally a lot more exciting than this. So hopefully, uh, I'll see you later.